Our gospel lesson from this Sunday is found in the book of Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. So King Herod heard about it. Let me just stop in our lesson for today and tell you what the it is. The disciples have been sent out on a mission trip and had an astounding result of healing and power that overflowed uh, the working of God through them. And Herod heard about this story about what was done in the name of Jesus. So Herod heard about these things done in the name of Jesus, continuing on with our lesson. For Jesus' name had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he is Elijah. And others were saying, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard about it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself had sent men and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias held a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and had been protecting him. But when he heard of him, he was very perplexed. And yet he used to enjoy listening to him. So an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, held a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leaders of the people of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want. I will give it to you. So he swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give it to you, up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and asked her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. So immediately she came in in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry because of his oath and his dinner guests, he was, willing, he was unwilling to refuse her. So immediately he sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back the head of John the Baptist. And when he went and beheaded him in the prison, he brought his head on a platter, he gave it to the girl, and he gave the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Now when his disciples heard about this, they came and carried away his body and laid it in the tomb. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word this day, and we pray that you would open up what you want to, us to hear through this lesson. For you ask us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we do invite you to partake of our lesson for today by following along in the handout, and we hope that you will. It's an opportunity and a way for you to study the scriptures and hopefully connect with the lesson for today. I want to tell you a little bit about John's lesson. It's hard to hear this is gospel or good news, the beheading of John the Baptist. But obviously, Jesus had struck a nerve. And so as we look at John the Baptist's ministry, Let's take a look at his context, first of all. The sons of Abraham, i.e. the Jews, had been disinherited. disinherited. Their land had, was now under the rule of Gentiles, in particular at this time the Romans. This is a circumstance that had been going on for hundreds of years. The Jews were under the thumb of the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians, right? And then they were under the thumbs... Uh, um, and then they were under, under the foot, thumbs of the Greeks, and then now the Romans. The Jewish tetrarchs, there were three sons of Herod, by the way. This is not to be confused with Herod the Great, the man uh, who we are talking about today. Herod the Great was a man who was the ruler at the time that Jesus was born, but he died soon after Jesus was born, and Herod left his inheritance, the land of three different of his sons named Hmm. Herod, Herod, and Herod, okay? The one was called Philip, better known as Philip, but they're all three named Herod, right? But these sons were not truly Jews. They were Edomites, whose family had converted to Judaism. Therefore, Herod was not in the lineage of David and there had no right to sit on the throne of Israel. The Jews were expecting a Messiah, <clears throat> Perhaps even Elijah to return <clears throat> prior to the revelation of Messiah. And <clears throat> pardon me. And this is 
This is who many people thought John the Baptist was. So when John began his ministry out in the wilderness proclaiming a need for repentance, and people flocked to him in a well-traveled crossroads where people would often travel from north to Mesopotamia, all the way around to Italy, down to Egypt, and so it was a massively popular and very uh, uh, busy crossroads where John the Baptist was doing his ministry. He was surrounded by his own disciples, as was Jesus. But John's preaching was inherently political and a threat to the Roman rule, and this is why John was not very popular with people like Herod, who had power. He had diagnosed why the Jews had lost their land to these Gentile rulers, because they had strayed from God. Now I caution you, this is not a lesson which applies to the United States of America. I am very concerned when Christians think that somehow the United States is the promised land and the new nation through which God is working, which is not a biblical thing. So when Christians say the reason why we're struggling today is because we strayed from God, this is not the same message that we need to preach in the United States that was preached at the time of John. We are not the promised land. We are not the chosen nation of God. We're just a nation in the United States. I love my country, but it's not the chosen nation of God. Okay, so let's keep these things straight. That is not what we should be hearing when we're hearing this lesson. John taught specific things of what it meant to lead an ethical life, including that she, people should not make a profit at the expense of others. Hmm. It is kind of interesting. We have literally billionaires who do exactly that. Make a profit at the expense of others. That's all they are concerned about. How do we make a profit even if we buy a corporation and sell all its pieces off and make it profitable to us so that we can sell off the parts even if it costs the livelihood and the jobs of the people who work for them. That seems a little bit unjust. I think John would have something to say about that. Well, Jesus came before John to be baptized. John recognized the greatness of his cousin because that's who Jesus was. And he was humbled that Jesus was willing to submit himself to John's call of repentance because of all people, Jesus didn't need to. But here's where we come to the next part of this story which relates to the lesson for today. John was finally arrested by... <laughs> Uh, by Herod because again John was a threat he was a political messenger this didn't sit well with Herod because John had called Herod to account on many different occasions now we look at the next page the execution of John Pre John preached for a year after baptizing Jesus before being imprisoned by Herod and he was imprisoned at what was called the Castle of Macarius. It is a very isolated castle, but within seeing distance of the Jordan Valley where John baptized Jesus. He spent about four months, according to the biblical timeline, in prison. And during this time, John had many doubts about who this Jesus was. Yes, he was his cousin. But was Jesus truly the Messiah and the one to come? We are told now we connect with this story. John, or pardon me, Herod did not want to execute John because even though he preached a message that seemed to be at odds with Herod's self-interest, he kept him alive. He was a little concerned that maybe, just maybe, John is speaking the truth. And so we're told in our lesson for today that in a drunken state of stupidity, Herod made a promise to the daughter of Herodias, the woman with whom he was living. Oh, by the way, he was also legally married to one of Herod's brothers. How amazing is that, okay? Hmm, this sounds very contemporary. He promised her that he would give her anything if she would just stand after the dance for him. And so she, at the 
uh, request of her mother went and asked for the head of John the Baptist. Herod was willing to execute John and had to because if he had not done so, he would have lost face with the people that were at the party. In other words, losing face was more important than his morality, his values. That shows how uh, threatening John was, that he was seen and appeared to be a rival, okay? How he annoyed Herodias. But Herod had made this public vow. So he had to give in to her wishes. So as not to lose face with his friends. So this lesson for us in John's story, there's got to be something for here because it doesn't sound like very good news today. How do we learn something about Jesus? How do we see something of value in this for us today? How do we apply this today? The one thing I would say is we need to take a look at John. No greater prophet has ever walked the earth, Jesus said, than John the Baptist. And yet the this least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than he. But John, the greatest of all prophets to walk the planet of the earth, had a season of doubt. He wrestled in faith. And that flies against all those Christians who want to throw in your face. If you doubt, you're not believing in God. Everybody doubts. John the Baptist doubt. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. And I say that to you as an assurance. If you have a season of doubt or questions about your relationship with God, here's my comment to you. Good for you. Doubt is a healthy thing. Because through doubt, we develop a stronger relationship with God. Doubt is a normal part of the human experience. And it drives us to pursuit of knowledge and improvement in our lives. Doubt is only troubling when it leads to resignation and blind acceptance. I just remember, just watched the uh, Olympic time trials in the United States just the other day, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a woman named Gabby Thomas, who is literally one of the greatest 200 meter uh, sprinters in the country and in the world. And she said when her, in her interview how she doubted, how she had imposter syndrome. How she wondered whether she actually even belonged on the worldwide stage <coughs> and if she had any talent at all, which for us is preposterous. This woman is literally one of the fastest sprinters in the world. But she wondered whether she even, she doubted herself. She wondered if she belonged. And yet here she is, one of the greatest sprinters in the world. We all doubt sometimes. But she said she turned that doubt into working even harder. When a doubt, what you do need to do is not resign yourself to that doubt, but keep searching, seeking, and exploring. The good news of this season of Pentecost, we're reminded that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us through those doubts. Then the last page, number two, look, John claimed that there would also be one greater than he, than he who was to come. John always pointed beyond himself. This is the other thing we learned from our gospel lesson for today. Many people in this world are consumed by the cult of self. That is particularly true in the United States of America, and that is really true in the Christian church. It's me and my faith and my healing and my blessing. We saw that during COVID, churches that were just being defiant Defiant when we are called to be obedient. We uh, churches today are, are are consumed by consumerism, obsessed by consumerism, marked by an occupation of the self. It's all about getting my healing, my blessing. Many have rejected the consumerism of their parents, but have replaced it with edification and self improvement. Oh, and we're so fixated on these things. On the surface, they appear to be good things because they're informed by education and enlightenment. However, it's just the same lyric, different lyrics, or same lyrics to a different tune. That's all it is. We have fallen into the trap of self. The cult of self, whether fed by consumerism or whether it's pandering to one's own personal feelings or to an exclusionary 
dedication to one's own tribe that we see today in our politics. Isn't that crazy? It is always destructive to community and to those around us until we see the other, our next door neighbor, who looks different than us, who votes different than us as a human being and treat them as such. We do not have Jesus in our hearts. So John is always pointing beyond himself, and the one to whom he is pointing brings him full circle, away from it, or half, uh, completely away from himself to the love of others. And then I think the last thing we learned from John is that we Christians are to point to the one who transcends Jesus Christ himself. For the legitimacy of any Christian message, or any Christian, him or herself, is defined whether we point to ourselves or to Jesus as the source of our hope. The acknowledgement of something transcendent frees us from the cult of self and restores us to proper relationship with the planet, with others, and with God. It was interesting, I just uh, finished reading a, a um, article by Soren Kierkegaard called Conclusions, or Concluding Chapter or something. Concluding Chapter, Concluding Thoughts. That's what it was titled. Not a very exciting, catchy uh, uh, title for a, an article. But in it, he was warring against what was called Hegelian philosophy. And you're like, what is Hegelian philosophy? It's an objectification of human beings. And you're even saying, what in the world is he talking about? So let me tell you the sum of it. He argues that at some point, if we humans are to find meaning in our life, we need to let go and trust in God. This was back in the 1860s he wrote this. Who was he? Uh, again, he, I already mentioned this Hegelian philosophy that he was warring against, but he's also warring against another guy who had another way of setting humans free, and that guy's name was Karl Marx who said that we need to let go of consumerism, which I agree with, but his solution was political communism would free human beings to be who they are supposed to be. Soren Kierkegaard understood that that's not going to free us. We're now bound to government. He says we are free when we give ourselves to God. So I'm inviting you today to free, be free, be set free. By coming and submitting to God in your life. By pointing to Him. By being free of self, consumerism, self-edification. We give ourselves over to God today, just like John the Baptist. Despite our doubts, despite our warts, despite our faults, God will set us free. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful again for the blessings of this day, of this message, of John the Baptist, who in his doubts gave himself regardless over to you. For this we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.